Okay, so thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I have tried to make something uh, more pedagogical, uh, but indeed um, I'm talking about a recent work that I have done with uh, Liliana Rachea. She's a researcher in the University of San Martín in Buenos Aires and uh, by me. So the, all the details are published in this reference. And first I will make a, I will make a, a, a kind of a review about quantum transport, uh, time-dependent quantum transport, and um, more specifically on heat. Uh, all of you, I think, that uh, have already uh, known about this uh, type of uh, systems and, and, and formalists uh, because you have attended to the lectures by David Sanchez that uh, he has explained uh, many of the concepts that I'm going to introduce here. So this is not going to be uh, unfamiliar, I think, for you. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I, I'm, try, I, I'm going to try to motivate the, mm, the topic of this talk. Then uh, I will tell you about the heat and charge flow uh, in the linear response regime, mm, the stationary state regime, and then uh, we will move to the time-dependent quantum transport this, because this is the the, the main um, objective of this talk, and uh, we are going to uh, analyze the heat indeed. The heat in, in the time-dependent uh, case for two regimes, for the linear transport regime and for the adiabatic transport. Okay, so this is more or less in general, but then uh, I'm going to, um, to apply all these concepts, except the linear transport uh, regime, uh, I'm going to apply all these uh, concepts to the uh, a specific to a specific system that is a hybrid system. So the two setups that we uh, analyze are first the the usual one, a quantum dot, um, and the one that. Uh, it's uh, new for us that is the hybrid uh, uh, setup that is again a quantum dot but in which uh, here for instance you have uh, two tunneling barriers uh, characterized by the tunneling rates gamma uh, one and two uh, in the middle you consider that you have um, a, qu uh, um, a quantized uh, level that is given by this epsilon naught. This is the energy level of this quantum dot. And then you have two electronic reservoirs. TL and TR are the temperatures of these uh, two reservoirs. And they can be biased by BL and by BR. So this is uh, a quantum dot. Indeed, in a quantum dot, you can also consider that uh, whenever you put charges inside the dot, then there is a Coulomb repulsion. So in that case, you have an interacting quantum dot. And uh, the common setup contains two reservoirs that are metallic. So the, the, the novel thing that we have introduced <coughs> in our research is to consider that one of these metallic reservoirs indeed is a superconducting uh, reservoir. So then you consider the you can consider different transport regime the stationary state when there is no AC or uh, time dependent uh, potentials in the system or when there is an uh, AC driving field and in that case you need to consider time dependent quantum transport formalism. Okay, so if you want to know almost everything about time-dependent transport in quantum dots, then you can read this a nice review. And um, because there you can also find a lot of reference. So uh, why is uh, important to uh, is investigate the heat in, in, 
in the in the quantum transport formalis because well uh, you know that every year the chips are smaller and smaller and smaller the integrate chips are smaller uh, the integrate chips are in the uh, technology that we have in all the devices that we manage every day so we are arriving to very very small uh, sizes uh, of the order of nanometers few nanometers and at these uh, scales then of course you need to introduce quantum mechanical a quantum mechanical description and also you need to know because in these chips you have some uh, electrical flows, electrical currents, then you know that this electricity dissipates heat and then you know to how to control this heat or maybe how to convert this waste heat into uh, useful electricity. Okay. So by uh, means of this uh, conversion between heat and electricity, then you can build kind of fancy devices like, like this that are based on the Siebeck and Peltier effects. So uh, in a prototypical system, what you have is your nanostructure that can be this quantum dot that we mentioned before. Then you can have some battery to establish an electrical flow here or some thermal gradient um, that also can establish this uh, electrical flow. And and also because uh, these two forces, the thermal gradient and the, the electrical bias, then there is also the, the, the occurrence of a heat flow or heat current. In the linear response regime, you can just consider that the electrical current and the heat current are just uh, linear functions of the electrical voltage and temperature. And then you obtain this uh, matrix uh, description for the two currents. So this is the electrical, th this is the linear response regi regime for the electrical and the thermal transport. You can even uh, treat more complicated uh, systems with many, many, many different uh, multi-terminals. Um, and then in that case, this matrix here that uh, contains the conductances so this is the electrical conductance, thermoelectrical, uh, electrothermal, and thermal conductance. They are, in the case of the multi-terminal system, they are indeed uh, matrices. Uh, OK, so this is the linear response regime. And as I said before, we are interested on uh, computing these two electrical uh, and thermal or heat flows in this type of systems where you have discrete energy levels, quantum dot is um, um, described by uh, these energy levels. And in some cases, you can even consider that you have coulomb repulsion. I mean, when you put one electron in the quantum dot and you put the next one, then there is a U that is the coulomb repulsion between them. OK. Uh, in a very Mm, simple picture, as David has explained in uh, his lectures, you can uh, easily write down the expression for the electrical and the heat flows uh, in terms of the scattering matrix, which is given by this S here. Okay, so in in a particular system where you have two terminals, then it's easy to see that uh, the electrical current is just given by the transmission through the nanostructure times the Fermi function difference between the two terminals. And for the heat, then you have the same expression, but now instead of transporting the charge like here, you transport the amount of energy or heat, and then the, this integral contains this uh, this new factor with respect to the uh, charge current that is E minus the charge of the electron times the potential at which you are measuring the heat flow. 
so if you uh, consider that your system is charge conserving, the charge is conserved, then you can see that in a two terminal system, the current in the left and in the right, they are the same with opposite signs. And also, uh, if you sum all the heat currents, then you end up with a dissipating term, that is the U heat term. Okay. So this is for a two terminal system in, a, mm, in the framework of the scattering matrix theory. And um, this is something that is uh, easily handled because uh, at the end, to obtain in the stationary state uh, all the uh, currents, you just need the, the scattering matrix. But the previous one, uh, the previous uh, um, discussion was about the stationary state. Now, if we are applying a, an AC potential, AC field, for instance, like here, you can have, a, this is the simplest system that we can imagine. We can even remove one of the reservoirs. And in that case, uh, this system behaves like a quantum capacitor. Because now we are uh, forcing the system with an AC field. Okay, and now we are going to see why we call this quantum capacity. Okay, so again, uh, you can establish a, a, a heat flow and an electrical flow in this type of system when you um, have a system at equilibrium. I mean, you don't apply any thermal bias, any electrical bias, but you can have some driving force in your system. And in that case, then, um, you can uh, investigate this, uh, uh, s this setup, the transport properties, uh, for two cases when the AC uh, driving amplitude is very small. In that case, you are in the linear response regime. Or in the case where you are in the adiabatic regime, where the AC uh, frequency is sufficiently small compared to the uh, other typical um, time scales in your system. Okay. So for a small AC driving amplitude, when the, the amplitude of the AC field is very small, then you can do what we did before, but now uh, you see that uh, the electrical and the heat flow, all uh, the two of them depends on the, the frequency. Okay. Because now our problem is time dependent. And then you can also define what is called the Onsager matrix that um, relate these two currents to the driving forces that in this case uh, is just the electrical um, potential that depends on time and eventually you can even have some temperature that depends on, on, the, on time. So uh, in the, uh, the, uh, in the um, linear response regime, when you describe the system by this Onsager matrix, you can calculate uh, the, the, the first term of this matrix, that is the electrical uh, conductance. And by uh, doing an uh, expansion in the frequency, you can uh, see that this um, admittance, this is indeed the admittance, is the response uh, uh, of the electrical current to a electrical uh, signal that depends on time. So if you expand this in, in the AC frequency, you obtain exactly the same equation as you have for a classical RC circuit. With the um, pecu peculiarity that now the, these coefficients, C and R, are um, coefficients that um, they have um, they, they are related to the quantumness of the system, which means that now this C is not only the, the geometrical capacitance, but is the quantum capacitance. And is given by the geometrical capacitance times the density of a state of our central uh, system, or the quantum dot in that case. Uh, and this R now is what is called the charge relaxation resistance that is just a universal 
uh, value given by h over 2e squared. So in this um, expression for the admittance, it's important to realize that now this R is a universal resistance. And on top of that, it does not depend on the transmission of the nanostructure. I mean, you can have a situation where the transmission through this uh, quantum dot is very, uh, is very low, but uh, this resistance is independent of that. And it has always the same uh, value. This is the universal quantum resistance. But this is only when the temperature is sufficiently um, low. Um, indeed, this result is only achieved at zero temperature. Mm? OK, so for the moment, we have uh, just introduced the heat and electrical transport in the stationary regime. Then we have seen that you can uh, just focus on the linear response regime for the stationary case and also for the uh, AC case, which is this one in which you can have very nice, a very nice uh, result in, in, in the sense that the electrical transport uh, is described by this universal channel relaxation resistance. Okay. But our work is not about that. It's about a time-dependent signal, but, um, but in the other regime, in the case where the, uh, the, the AC amplitude can be arbitrary, but the, the, the region is in that way that is, uh, the time dependence is adiabatic. I mean, the, the AC frequency is very, very small compared with the other time scales in the system. So this is uh, the, the, the main um, case that we study uh, from now to the end. And um, now uh, we start with a Hamiltonian that uh, can be split in several pieces. Uh, in the systems that we are um, analyzing, we have the Hamiltonian due to the leads, due to the tunneling, that is the part that connects the central part with the leads, and the central part. Okay. Uh, it has been demonstrated that uh, if you consider now these uh, rates, I mean, uh, this is just uh, how the central Hamiltonian um, varies with time, right? Um, the lead and the tunneling, you consider these rates, they, they do not um, um, describe the heat flow or the energy flow in the system. Mm? Um, I mean, um, one could na naively think that these three rates could describe a kind of energy flow, but it's not a physical uh, energy flow or current, but it's, but it's not. Um, because um, the right definition, for instance, for the heat flow is this one in which you need to uh, define the heat current in the lead, considering how the energy of the heat Hamiltonian uh, of the lead Hamiltonian uh, change with time, which is this term. Well, you just uh, subtract the term that gives you the Joule heating. And then you need to add this new term. And this is, some, this is a result that uh, David Sanchez and co-workers obtained in a series of uh, papers in the last years in which they demonstrate that you need indeed to take into account this term in order to fulfill a series of uh, requirements that are important to have. For instance, uh, only if you define the heat flow in the lead in this way, considering the, the, the energy that is stored in the, in, the, in the barrier, because this is a term that uh, contains the, the tunneling, then you are consistent with the first law of, the thermodyna of thermodynamics. Then you obtain the same result like you will have, um, uh, would have 
if you consider scattering formalism, because in scattering formalism, mm, mm, this formalism never divides the system in pieces. It's just a continuous system. So because of that, this uh, tunneling term that we put here, because we are dividing the system in pieces, is not needed. So to be consistent with the scattering formalism, and uh, also to be consistent with the second law of, the thermodyam of thermodynamics, then uh, you need to include this term here that is uh, sometimes called reactance. Mm -hmm. So then in our work with the superconducting contact, we will see that indeed you really need to, to include this. I mean, all these uh, statements here that you need to be consistent with the first law, uh, you need to, to be consistent also with other formalities that are continuum models, and uh, second law, they have been proof that uh, this is uh, indeed like, like this um, for normal contacts, but not for superconducting contacts. And in our work, uh, we have checked that uh, to be consistent, then we need also to, to include this term. So, well, um, we can now ask about this uh, current in the lead, but also we can think about how the energy uh, changes in the, in the central part, and then we end up with this equation here, and uh, indeed the en how the energy changes in the central part is given by this uh, Q, that is the commutator with the total Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian in the central part, and this is just the uh, power uh, that generate the AC source. So then one could, in analogy to the leads, uh, one could just um, uh, define a kind of heat flow in the central part in the way that at the end, by adding the two uh, uh, floats, then the total um, uh, dissipated um, dissipated um, heat uh, energy, the total dissipated energy is given because you also have this this condition is given by the power that is generated by the uh, electrical forces by the fact that you can have some uh, finite bias voltage and the uh, AC sources. So the power developed by the standard forces. AC and DC batteries is dissipated in form of heat. So this is one of the main results that uh, David and co-workers, they have uh, in, in some of their papers. And, uh, and now we are going to apply uh, part of this machinery to our particular setup that consists, as I said before, in a quantum dot with two barriers, then you have some superconducting uh, contact and a normal reservoir. So then we apply some AC field to the uh, dot uh, level, um, and then we ask about uh, how is the uh, time-dependent heat current in this system, and how is the, um, the power as well. Okay. So then, um, for that, we just uh, compute the power that is given by the charge of the, of the dot, and then is uh, multiplied by the um, time de derivative of the uh, AC force. Um, so we know, as we said before, that the total uh, dissipated heat is given in form of, is, is, is indeed supplied by the, the, the power of the AC source. And uh, then um, we can now calculate uh, this uh, power. And also, uh, by, having, by, by having this power, then we can also have this dissipated heat. <coughs> so this is our Hamiltonian. <coughs> that is a split in four parts. Now the leads are 
normal superconductor given by this. And then if you sum all of them, then you get this identity that is uh, quite straightforward. And now you can define uh, this type of flows in the way that you fulfill what we said before, that the total dissipated heat is equal to the power supplied by the AC source. Okay. So now we know how to calculate this uh, dissipated heat through the power. The power is indeed given by this expression here. And what is complicated here is how to uh, calculate the quantum occupation of the dot that depends on time. So in this expression, this is something that is difficult to calculate uh, because of the presence of the AC field. Uh, uh, also, we are not considering uh, interacting quantum dot. In that case, could be even more complicated. Okay, so then our theoretical treatment is within the adiabatic approximation to calculate this heat product production flow. Adiabatic approximation means that the AC frequency is sufficiently slow. So we are focused on the adiabatic dynamics. In that case, then we can just make a kind of expansion for the dot ch chart or the dot occupation. Uh, this is given by what is called the frozen occupation plus sun correction. Uh, and this correction is indeed a correction at first order in the AC frequency because it depends on this the time derivative of the AC uh, voltage. Okay, so then we can just introduce this, um, this uh, expansion for the occupation of the dot and then we have two terms. One term is this one that is linear in B dot and the other one is quadratic in B dot, B, BG or B dot. So the first one is uh, a term that is conservative because if you time average this term, then it's zero. And the dissipative part uh, comes from this other uh, term here that, is, that depends on B dot squared. Um, okay, so now how to calculate this capital lambda here. Well, uh, we know that this capital lambda here uh, indeed comes from the um, expansion of the quantum dot occupation um, expression. So then let us start with uh, the calculation of this quantum dot occupation expression. Now, um, now uh, some difficulties arise because uh, since we have a superconductor, then we can have a pairing of electrons. And then our formalism for the green function is not the usual one. The one that uh, David has explained in his lectures is a bit more complicated because you need to consider the anomalous propagator that uh, tell you that electrons can be uh, can be in pairs. So uh, here, this is your green function, but now your green function is expanded in a four in a two by two matrix with four components. And uh, this first component is just the usual um, electronic green function that that you are used to you to to employ. And this is the time reversal. Um, of this one, of the electronic one. So this is let's say uh, for electrons, this is for hole. And the off-diagonal green function tell you about the, the pairing between electrons. So this is daga daga, which means that you can have the possibility to um, glue two electrons there. Okay, so then we for for our uh, objective, we need to calculate this capital lambda. This capital lambda comes from the dot occupation, and the dot occupation is given by this green function that is called the lesser green function that for superconductors it has 
four components. So this is then the occupation. You have different components, A and G, and it's given by the usual expression. This, this is the Fermi function and this is the density of state given by this expression here. This is again our four by four matrix for the green function, but indeed here this is retarded and this is advanced. And, in, and then we adopt this, this notation. The first element is just given by this n, simple n, and the off diagonal element of this uh, uh, occupation here is given by this eta. That tell you about the anomalous propagator. So now uh, we need to obtain this green function. And then again, this is the hardest um, work that we have to do. So the, 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 the way to do this is just considering that you had two interactions. One is the AC field, and the other one is the, the, the hopping or the tunneling term. Your Hamiltonian, let's say, uh, it's just the superconducting part, the methyl part, and the quantum dot part. And interactions here, or the perturbation here, is the AC field and the, and the, um, the tunneling part. In that sense, then you can write now uh, a Keldys equation that gives you this expression here for this green function that uh, remember that it's a four, it's a two by two matrix and then uh, here you have the retarder the advanced and this is a self energy that take into account the tunneling term uh, so the tunneling term is composed by two terms the superconducting and the normal term and also uh, these green functions the retarder and advanced they contains the ac field that in a perturbation theory, when you resum all the terms, you can just write down in the way that we are going to see now. Uh, this is the retarded green function that you can uh, you can uh, display these two uh, forms for the green function in a kind of Fourier transform or Fourier decomposition. But uh, considering the AC field and summing all the terms, you get this nice uh, uh, expression here that was obtained by Liliana and co-workers uh, in which you have here the retarded green function in terms of the retarded green function is the same but at different energies so it's a equation that you cannot easily um, get the solution because this depends on the others that are the same as this. Okay. So then we need to do an approach, and the adiabatic approach comes now, which means that now um, <coughs> we are going to replace this green function here by the frozen uh, green function. And also we are going to keep only terms in this equation that are linear in omega, because we are doing an expansion in the uh, AC frequency. So by doing this, then one can write this expression for the total green function in the adiabatic approximation. That depends only on something that we know, that is this frozen green function, that uh, is indeed the green function for uh, for um, a quantum dot uh, in the absence of the AC field minus the AC driving here. So then by putting here this and here this and here this, then we, we have the, the total green function. Uh, this green function contains also the tunneling terms. So it contains the effect of the superconducting lead and the normal contact. Mm -hmm. So then now we have this green function with the advance and the retarder. We can get the lesser green function. With the lesser green function, we can get the occupation. And then we get this expression for this capital lambda. 
So this is like here. So this occupation is given by this. This is put here. And then we can just read which is this capital lambda here. OK, so if we make some calculations, then at the end we end up with some expression for this capital lambda, which is given by this. And what is interesting here? First, uh, this is an integral over the energy. And this is the derivative of the Fermi function. The derivative of the Fermi function at zero temperature is just a delta function, so at the Fermi energy. So now, if we want to compute this at the at zero temperature, we just need to get these two functions evaluated at zero energy, if the Fermi energy is zero. And these two functions, they are just the density of state of the dot. The first is the first element in this matrix that I showed before uh, in the Nambu Keldis formalis. So this is the density of a state in the kind of electronic part. And this is the anomalous part <coughs> in a superconductor. So then uh, the power, the dissipated power uh, for our system is composed by the two terms. One is uh, given by um, the dissipation from the, let's say, the normal part. Mm? And the other one is from the anomalous part. Mm? So, um, so then we can split in these two terms the normal part or normal density of a state, the electronic part. So it's the first element in this matrix. And the other one is the off-diagonal element in that matrix. Uh, give you this kind of anomalous dual uh, dissipating uh, heating. Okay, so now with this result, now we keep this result apart, and then we uh, we we are um, wonder if we could get some kind of uh, instantaneous dual low for this uh, expression here. Because we know that for a normal quantum dot, this is something that is uh, that is uh, really a result. So you can get some instantaneous Joule low. So now we wonder if we could have the same. So for that, then we just um, uh, look at the chart dynamic of the dot. And then we can calculate how the normal chart in the dot evolves in time. And then we, in this way, we can define this as a capacitance, normal capacitance. And this is the anomalous uh, part of the chart uh, in the dot that is given by this anomalous capacitance. So by defining these two capacitance, then um, we can indeed see that uh, the normal par part of the dissipation and the anomalous part of the dissipation are given by an instantaneous uh, Joule law in the sense that now uh, you can have this uh, dissipation for the normal part with some R naught that is uh, again this universal quantum resistance that is constant. In that way, we can look at our system as a kind of uh, equivalent circuit, RC circuit, in which uh, the, the dissipated uh, heat uh, in, the normal, in the normal part is given by two different channels for spin up and spin down. This sigma is spin up and spin down, and is uh, represented by this uh, part of the circuit here and the anomalous um, part in which uh, you have uh, the anomalous propagator that contains the uh, pairing of, L of two electrons or two holes. So this is uh, given now by this other part of the, this is represented by this other part of the circuit in which now C is a, a capacitance that um, 
uh, we call anomalous capacitance because it takes into account this this um, uh, this pairing. So, okay. Uh, so, for the moment, we have obtained this uh, this instantaneous law for the Joule heating that. Uh, is uh, composed by two contributions and now we are going to repeat the same calculation but in a different fashion so now we are not going to start with the power and calculate the power and the occupation of the dot and the green function of the dot and see if there is some um, sun instantaneous Joule heating we are going to start in a different way just calculating the heat at the normal contact. So the heat at the normal contact, as uh, David uh, told you in uh, his lectures, is given by the, this, this uh, part here that contains the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the, commutator with the Hamiltonian in the normal part. And then you need to add this one half of the tunneling contribution here. Okay. So if you compute this separately, this uh, average of the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the Hamiltonian in the normal part, so you get this expression in terms of green function, self-energy, whatever. You get also the same for the tunneling part. And then you just uh, consider the adiabatic approximation and only keep terms up to B dot square, then you get this result for the uh, energy, well, so for the heat flow at the normal contact. Mm -hmm. so you get this result. Okay, we have this result, and now we calculate separately the electrical current in the normal in the normal lead. We again have uh, a very complicated expression in terms of green functions, again adiabatic approximation, and we keep terms at two BG uh, dot linear. <coughs> so then we obtain this expression. And now we compare the dissipated heat with the uh, electrical current. And we see that we can have some kind of one by one uh, relation between this term and this term, and this term, and this term. In the way that we can make can a kind of <coughs> uh, separation uh, in terms of instantaneous Joule uh, law for the normal part and the anomalous part, as we obtained before. But uh, what I want to <coughs> emphasize here is that we, are, we, we have the same result as before, but we are <coughs> arriving to this in a very different way. And what is important also here is that we, for this new calculation, we need explicitly to consider this contribution from the tunneling barrier. Okay, so then, um, as a result, the instantaneous, we, we have the instantaneous dual heating in terms of equivalent RC circuits for the normal part and the anomalous part. And then we also need to include this one half of the tunneling contribution for the heat in the normal contact in order to have a coherent uh, result. Ten minutes, okay. Uh, okay, well, um, now we can make a deeper analysis of this uh, capacitance that we obtained before. The normal one, that remember that this comes from the density of states of the dot, but for the electronic part. And the normal one indeed contains two processes. It contains the process in which you can transport electrons from, from one side to another, normal mm, transport but also it contains the effect of androgen processes. So uh, the normal part, that is this rho 1, 1, so it's the first element in this matrix, 
indeed contains also superconductivity. Mm? And then we have superconductivity in, the, in this term here. Okay, so these correspond to this, and these correspond to this. And um, then the dynamic of the charge of the dot is given by the dynamic of these two capacitance that uh, contains the normal transport processes and the unrejected transport processes. And then we have also these anomalous capacitance. And it's interesting to see that indeed these anomalous capacitance uh, tell you that there is uh, something there that also dissipate uh, heat. And if you compute, as we dis did before, this uh, Joule heating due to this anomalous term, we can see that uh, indeed mm, the, the, the physical meaning of this capacitance, anomalous capacitance, is that is telling you that uh, is dissipating the energy when you are uh, just uh, breaking or forming uh, new copper pairs. So this uh, contribution to the heat dissipation in terms of this anomalous capacitance is due to the pair breaking or pair formation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, these are the results. I'm, I'm just briefly uh, telling you some, um, some of the main features of the results. So here uh, we, are, uh, we have just plot the two capacitances, the, let's say, the normal one and the anomalous one. And we see that <coughs> in both cases <coughs> they have two peaks and the, the, the structure is repeating in time. So this is uh, versus time. Mm? And each peak uh, is just the uh, quasi-bound state peak uh, that is aligned with the Fermi energy in the lead. And in that case, then you get uh, a peak. So one for, uh, well, y you know that the, the uh, Andrzej bound states, they are coming in pairs. So then you have these two pairs, uh, these two peaks that uh, are forming just one pair. And, um, and then um, you can also consider the normal uh, capacitance and to split in two contributions, the normal part and the Andrzej part, Andrzej, uh, due to the Andrzej uh, processes. And, um, the main difference between them is that for the Andrej part, then this doesn't uh, get zero when uh, the normal part gets directly zero. And this is because uh, it's due to the Andrej uh, transport processes. So the separation of these two peaks is given by the ratio between gamma S and gamma N. N. So the, if the separation decreases, then the peaks are Mm, just close it to each other. Well, I, I, not, I don't want to enter too much in this. Um, and this is the final result, because this is more technical now, I think. Um, so for the power, then uh, again, uh, you have uh, two peaks, because they refer reflect the dynamic of the superconductor the energy bound states and uh, you get these peaks whenever the energy uh, levels are an aligned with the chemical potential and um, <coughs> you always have some joule uh, dissipation because because uh, the capacitance due to the energy processes is non zero between the peaks as we um, uh, saw before and uh, another result is that for the anomalous part, you always get zero in the middle because the capacitance for the anomalous part uh, changes sign just in the middle of the, of the two uh, quasi-bound states. For that, then this anomalous capacitance is zero, and then the Joule, due to the Cooper pair breaking or formation, is zero in the middle of the under uh, peaks. So now comes the, the conclusions. So 
First, we have investigated in general uh, the time dependent heat transport. Uh, we have applied this theory to the uh, complex setup that is a quantum dot coupled to a normal and superconductor, superconductor contact. Um, the, we have calculated the total dissipation in our setup uh, in the adiabatic uh, regime. We obtain an uh, instantaneous Joule low uh, with a uh, universal resistance uh, and the analogy in terms of RC circuit with capacitance that contains uh, the normal part and the anomalous part. And uh, we um, and, and finally, we have seen that the instantaneous J low can be also calculated from the heat uh, flow in the normal contact uh, and the uh, electrical current in the normal contact. And in order to do that, we have seen that the normal heat current, the, the heat current in the normal contact need, needs to, to contain the um, reactants or the contribution of the tunneling uh, barrier. And finally, the future uh, project that can be continued or extended from here is just to treat first to treat the linear response regime of this uh, setup, also to include topological superconductor. That is not very complicated because it's just to change the green function of the of the problem by something that is a bit more complicated, but and, and the, at the end is just is not something complicated from the uh, theoretical point of view. It's just something that is complicated because you need to consider a more involved green function. We can also think about to include electron-electron interaction or spin-spin interactions in the quantum dot, or even we can consider more complex setup like double quantum dot, carbon nanotubes, or different environments. And I think that this is all. So thank you. And that's thank you. it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, my, my question is a bit related to the, uh, maybe I did not understand uh, completely, yeah. but my question is about this topological superconductor. superconductors. Mm, your results, um, uh, when you take the limit of the dot level to zero, is that similar to the fact of having a Majorana state or uh, like in a topological superconductor? Well, I mean, w yeah, maybe you mentioned the, yeah. the energy of the dot level. Yeah. Uh, which is intermediate, when this is precisely at zero? Actually, I did the calculation <laughs> one week ago, more or less. And uh, what you obtain is uh, indeed, uh, I mean, here I think that the calculation was done when the level is at zero. But since you have some gamma s, some pairing, finite pairing, then the, the energy bound state just split. But you are saying that in your uh, spectrum, you have a peak at zero. So, I mean, in the subcap spectrum, you have a peak at zero energy. In, the, in that case, that is the topological superconductor, then you get just a peak in the middle. So you don't get a split peaks. You get a peak in the middle. Well, there is a clear difference, yes, but uh, you can also think that in this case, the two peaks are very close to each other. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but uh, actually, uh, if you have a topological superconductor uh, with some gamma S and gamma N, in which uh, if the situation is just to have a normal superconductor, you see two peaks, then in a topological superconductor, you will see just one peak in the middle. More questions? I couldn't understand the your interpretation of the h over two e square result in terms of uh, two spin directions and electron hole. Maybe can you explain it again? Well, mm, yes. 
Well, it's just to consider that here you have um, two, S I mean, here you have uh, always electrons that mm -hmm. they have a spin up or spin, spin down. Mm -hmm. And then here you have, you can define a capacitance C and a resistance R naught. So since you have up and down, then you have up and down. However, here, this Q is the anomalous propagator. And then, indeed, there you have kind of electron and electron and hole and hole. Okay. With different spins. Different spins. Okay. So then you have electron and electron and hole and hole. I see. So it's different. Okay. But the resistance is the same for both. But the resistance is the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. I see. Thank you. Okay, so if there are more questions, we thank uh, Rosa again.